<laughs> Did Connor ever answer that email you sent? Being connected since we yeah. switched to broadcast. Yes. What did he say? It, it worked fine and okay. we should ask him how many people have been coming out there. Nice to nice to get a number. Oh you guys. Naughty naughty. Thank you. I haven't looked at it yet. I, uh, I'll, after class, we can take a look. Yeah. Or uh, afterwards, because, uh, yeah, I was still working my slides, so. Um.
We won't cover everything, but we'll cover most things. That's cut. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> If there's something we don't cover, you can ask me after. Uh, How's it look? Live. I'm I'm live. All right, let's fire it up. Well, it's it's good. It's very interesting. <laughs> Oh, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> Why don't you just start recording? <clears throat> mm. All right, here we go. All right, so today we're going to do another class that's a little more technical um, and not so much about data, so much as how you're going to present your data. Um, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness now. I tend to get very uh, opinionated in this class, um, so just take it with a grain of salt. So today we're going to be covering the basics of visualization, how to make your plots. We're going to talk about how to make it presentable and professional. Most of you are grad students. I've seen a lot of papers cross my desk back when I was a postdoc that I was reviewing where the plots were definitely not professional, not high quality. You can do better and you will. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about in today's class, how to make your plots pro. Advanced plotting techniques, and then we're going to talk about animations. Okay, so first we're just going to grind through a bunch of examples, how to make plots, different kinds of plots. First, we're going to create a variable called x, which has 100 data points, 1 through 100, scaled to 1. And then here's your classic, plot. All right, we've all seen this before, probably plot. You just give it a y value, and it's going to plot it versus the index, which is what you see here, right? We've got indices from 0 to 100, because we've got 100 data points. And then the value, of course, is just the sine function times 4 pi. So we get two waves. If we want to plot it instead against the, y -ax the x axis, we give it two arguments. Plot x, sine of x, 4 pi. And now instead of running across the index from 1 to 100, it's now running from 0 to 1. This is the normal way you plot things, right? Generally speaking, we don't plot against the index unless for some reason that's the nature of your data. Here I'm throwing in a bunch of optional arguments to plot. We're going to look at a lot of optional arguments in this class. Okay? First, I've changed. The data point, no, I didn't change it, did I? It's the same. It's O. O indicates the type, which is the default in this case. O, you can ask for lines, you can ask for triangles, you can ask for circles, squares, all kinds of things. We'll go over some of them. We changed the color to blue, and we turned off the axes. This is kind of silly. Obviously, you're not going to use this as your production quality plot, but it's just to demonstrate some of the possible functionality. If you want to add data on top of existing data, use the lines function. It's one way to do it. There are other ways to do it. By default, lines is going to create a line. You may not want a line. You might want a scatter plot instead. We'll go over how to do that. But in this case, lines plots another plot on top of the existing one. Change the color to red in this case. Call means red. And I can add a title. 
xlab time, this is the x label. Time is in seconds. You'll notice something not good happened here. Let me back up so you can see it again. Okay, that's before, that's after. We just threw the title on top of the existing title. That's not what you want, right? There's an X under there. Okay, we can do better. By default, plot does not rewrite the entire screen um, for title. It'll just keep adding titles on top of what's already there, which is not what you want. Be aware of that. Let's talk about plot, the details, the finickiness. Okay. If you're accustomed to plotting in Python with matplotlib, plotting in R is going to seem very clunky. One thing that Python does very well compared to R, one of the few things, is visualization. And the reason is because as I change, I can change my plot on the fly. In R, you can't do that. Once you execute your plot, it's there. You can't get rid of it. You've got to wipe it clean and start over if you want to change something. can't change things on the fly. And you can see that with plot, the default behavior is to overwrite or to clear the plot and get rid of it and plot a new one. Okay, right, that's the second bullet here. By default, every time plot is run, it overwrites the previous plot. It gets rid of it and, and creates a new one. If you want to add data to an existing plot, there are two ways to do it. One is to use the lines command, which we just saw. The second is to run the par command, new equals true. Par, we're going to go over par a little bit more in class. Par is your generic. Everything under the sun is in this function function. Okay, you want to do something with, with visualization, nine times out of ten it's in par. Okay, we'll go over some of the options using par. Okay. <clears throat> if you want to customize your axis labels, there are two ways to do it. One is you specify the when you invoke plot, right? It's part of the plot argument, and we'll see that later. I didn't do that. And by default, what plot does is exactly what you saw. It just plots the name of the variable that you just, you just plotted, right? That's why there was an x here. And that's why there's a sign of x times 4 pi on the y-axis here. Not probably what you want, OK? So you can specify it when you invoke plot as one of the arguments. Otherwise, you can do annotate equals false. Don't write anything. And I'll add it afterwards. That's another way to do that. OK? Then you add it later with the title command that we just saw. OK? If you want to open a second plotting window, or a third, or a fourth, you invoke the command dev.new. It will open up a new window for you. And you can start working on that while you keep the other one open so you can see them side by side. Sometimes that's what you need, right? Pop open a bunch of windows and start looking at things. Maybe that's part of your data analysis. Okay. To go back to the last one, you use dev.set and dev.previous. Go to the last one, or go to the next one, dev.next will get you to the next one. Or you can specify the number if you know the number of the plot. I'm not totally sure how that works. You'll have to double check that claim. But this is how you scroll between your windows. If you want to add something to this plot, come back over here, wipe this one clean, try again, move over here, do something over there, whatever. You can scroll between your windows. Questions? Here's par. Let's talk about par. The, there are like 50 arguments you can stick into par. We're going to go only just go over a few of them, and we'll see more later. Here are some of them. New, we talked about that already. Par, new equals true means put the next plot on top of the one that's already there. Be it, bear in mind that it will overwrite the x-axis again, the titles, if you let it. It's going to literally redraw on top of what's already there. So be aware of that, OK? You can specify the font family you want. Sans serif is a good one, OK? Always, always use either a vector font or a true type font when you are creating plots for publication. You can use whatever you want by default. But for publication, you don't want a raster font, which means a font that's drawn. Okay, it doesn't scale well. If I'm the publisher, I'm the layout artist at the, at the journal, 
and I'm trying to get these plots moved around, I might change the size slightly and things can get pixelated and stuff. You want a vector drawn font, which means either vector or true type, okay? Something that scales. You can change the font format. Usually we just want default, but you can choose bold or italic or bold italic. We talked about anotype equals false. Annotate, excuse me, means don't put any ax uh, titles on my axes. Okay, don't label, it may not label the, uh, the ticks either. I, I don't remember offhand if it changes that as well. We'll go over how to do this ourselves later on in the class, okay? MF row for subplots. I wanna put four plots on my plot. I have a plot with four windows in it. Two by two, three by one, one by three, whatever you want, okay? Give it a list or a vector of however you want your plots to appear on your window, on your screen, okay? Several plots together. Mar, margins. By default, ours plots have ridiculously huge margins. You've probably noticed when you plot something. There's all this white space floating out there. Total waste of space for a, profession, for a publication quality plot, right? I don't need all that. And the layout artist at the journal is not going to cut it out for you. At least they never did for me. Okay, they're not allowed to, probably. This is the figure they gave me. I can't start carving it out, right? That's not my job. My job is to put this in the journal, even if it's full of white space. So I'll show you how to fix that so that you can make your uh, plots look very presentable. As I said, there are millions of options here. It can get a little confusing and fairly daunting. Question mark par if you want to see them all, right? Help par. They're all in there. They're all documented. Good luck. <laughs> there are lots of them. Because you can tweak everything you want. Let's go over some more examples. Subplots. Here's our variable again, x. I want to do two by two. Okay. Plot, we've seen this before. X, sine of two pi x. Very nice, I plot again. I move to the next window by default, right? This time I'm plotting sine of four x. I've changed it to a line, type equals L. The color is now purple. You may not be able to see that very well. And I gave it a title. Remember how I said we can put the labels in the arguments of the plot function. There it is, Y lab. Stands for a Y label, sine wave. And we get that. Instead of sine of 2 pi x, we get sine wave on the Y axis. Plot again. Sine of 4 pi, type line, color brown. Sine wave again, this time the line width, LWD, line width is 10. So it's a big blah, blobby line. But you can read it at least, but it's kind of crayony. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> it's for illustration purposes only. Questions? All right. It's pretty straightforward. We're going to go through the straightforward examples first, just so you can know that these things exist. We've seen the air quality data set before. I've used this example in a previous slide where we talk about the ozone levels, right? Bad days versus good days. What are the ozone levels in this data set? Well, I can plot a histogram. Hist, ozone, the ozone uh, vector of this data subset. And you can see hist is a nice function. It'll bin the data for you. Okay, you don't have to bin it ahead of time. If you're plotting a bar plot, for example, you have to pre-bin your data. Bar plot won't bin it for you. That's what a histogram is for. Okay, you can see the frequency on the left. Unfortunately, again, it says data dollar sign ozone, which is probably not what you want. If you want to change that, you have to put the X, the X lab argument in there. Again, we've done this before. Give me the number of days when the ozone is greater than 20. So most of the data set, as it happens. Create a table out of it. Look at it by month. You can see it's there. I want the month names, though, not these five, six, seven, eight, that's nice, but it's nice to have month names. So I'm gonna take month name, remember that vector? We saw it earlier on in the class. It's a built-in vector of month names, as integer names, 
result. So take the names out of the result, turn them into integers, and use them as indices from month name. So now I have strings with months. And then I'm going to take that, the result, and turn it into a vector. And then I'm going to make a pie, pie chart out of it. Okay, pie, bad month counts, which is the values, of course, and then the label, bad months. You can see June, July, August, May, September. Okay, otherwise it would have done five, six, seven, eight, nine by default. Color, here I'm invoking a color palette. There are several built-in color palettes in R, something like five or six built-in ones. Terrain colors is one of them. I guess it's based on the colors used by cartographers, I imagine. Generally, these work on the principle that um, it's actually a function. You give it a number that indicates how many colors you actually want. Length of result says, I want five colors, please. You give it the five colors, and then it uses them to make the pie chart. then I put a box around it. Put a box around it just to show you how much white space is in this thing, more than anything. It's a lot of white space there. Questions? OK, let's do a little bit more. Contour plots. I did a lot of contour plots when I was a grad student. Here I'm creating some data, x and y. Just a sequence from four, negative 4 pi to positive 4 pi in length with a length of n, so 27 steps, OK? Nothing fancy. Notice that you can do that. I don't know if we've shown you that before. x is assigned the value of y, which is assigned the value of sequence. Allows you to assign two variables at the same time if they're going to be equal to each other, right? x and y, in this case, are the same thing, so I don't have to type out the same command twice. You can do it in one shot. x is assigned the value of y, is just assigned the value of whatever it is I'm looking for. OK? x squared is a matrix. I'm going to repeat x squared n times. OK, remember that x is a vector. So I'm taking my vector. I'm squaring it. Then I'm going to repeat that n times. And then I'm going to have n rows. So I've got an n by n matrix where each row is x squared. Same for y, except the transpose of x now. The reason I'm doing that is so that I can make a plot of an exponential, two-dimensional exponential, Gaussian, our normal distribution, our old friend or enemy, depending on how you like these things. Filled contour. We'll fill your contour. X and Y gives the x-axis and y-axis, which are 1D, exponential, negative x squared plus y squared, and some normalizing factor just so it sits nicely on the plot. OK, uh, the default color scheme for filled color is, I think it's called CM colors. So you get this blue-pink combination. By default, filled contour will create a color bar, as you see on the right-hand side. We'll tweak that in a later example, because in my opinion, there's way too much white space here. That's actually really hard to get rid of. As it turns out, I spent a whole day of my life figuring that out. Add a title. Questions? OK. 3D. Everyone needs 3D plots in their life, right? Absolutely. Know you're a player if you've got 3D plots. Perspective is the function. Persp. Perspiration, I guess, is the first thing that comes to mind. Um, same data as last one, x squared plus y squared, negative exponential. You get your 3D plot. As you can see the lovely uh, Z label there, exponential of negative x squared plus y squared. Let's try again. That's a little better. You'll notice that I'm using the theta and phi commands now. You can actually tweak the perspective, right? Negative 50 degrees in the theta direction positive 30 degrees in the phi direction, and now I've changed the label. Z label is my Gaussian. That makes better sense. 
Okay, that's a little better. X and Y are labeled. That's nice. Maybe that's how you like it. I like the arrows. That's pretty cool. Nicely built in. But I want to put in a little bit of shading while I'm at it because that looks it even cooler now. All right, so same thing, but now I've added a shade factor. Shade is equal to 0.4. Now you get a little, little more three-dimensionality with a shadow added to it, right? That's cool. Not bad. All right. Good? Yes. Layer them? I mean, add more on top of it? That's a good question. I don't know. I assume so. Um, do a par new equals true and find out. I'm not sure. OK, that's enough for the basics. OK, if you think it ought to be in R, it is. Plot we've done lines. A, B line is a good one. A, B line draws a straight line. If you, in the form of y equals mx plus b, you just give it m and b, and it'll draw the line for you. Or you can just give it an LM fit. If you do an LM fit, just take the whole thing, drop it right into a, b line. It'll fit, it'll draw, plot it for you. Pretty slick. Histogram we've seen. Bar plot is like histogram, except it's not going to bin the data for you. You have to bin it ahead of time. Pi we've seen. It also does strip charts, box plots, dot charts, mosaic plots, you name it. Other plots I have never seen before are in there as well. Okay? Don't try to make your own. It's in there. Other commands. So those are the main ones you invoke, but there are others you can add on top, either after the fact or sometimes um, as arguments too. Arrows will add error bars to your data. Axis, we're going to see later, allows you to manipulate your axes, your tick marks, your labels, and so forth. Box, we've seen already, puts a box around your plot. Legend, highly recommended. Use legends. If your data has more than one piece of data on it, put a legend in there so it's easier for people to read. Right? Text will add text points, add specific points to your plot wherever you want to put them. That might be useful. Polygon will draw polygons usually if you want to color in underneath a line. You can use it to add color to specific pieces of your plot after the fact. Good? All right, rolling right along. This is cool, I've never seen this before. Locator and identify. So I've got my plot, it's got some huge time series on it, and I want to figure out what that point is right there. It's got, you know, it's got this little wiggle and then there's this big peak and I want to find out where that peak is. You use locator, this is cool. I'm not gonna demonstrate it, but here's the code from the command line. So I've got some plot, X and Y, it's just a linear plot. Right, 1 through 10 and 14 through 23, no big deal. Then I type the locator command. When I left click on the graph, it's going to give me the x and y coordinates of that position. So you can left click as many times as you want, and then when you right click on the graph, it gives you this, the x and y coordinates of those positions you just clicked on. So in this case, I clicked two times, and then I right clicked, and it gives me the X positions and the Y positions of the spots I clicked on the graph. That's pretty cool. I didn't know you could do that until a few days ago. Now it's handy. Now, identify does a similar thing, except that instead of returning the value of the X and Y coordinates on the graph, it's going to return for you the index of the point that's closest to where you're clicking. So I give it X and Y. And then I go to my graph, and I click on this peak, the top of that peak right there, boom, left click, and I right click, and it's going to give me the index so that I don't have to go hunting through my data to find it. Now I've got it. It's indexed 13,297, of course. In this case, I clicked three times. The first time, I was too far away. <laughs> it says no point within a quarter inch. I guess there's a minimum distance. And then I click two more times. And I got index 5 and 9 on the particular graph I was doing this on. Okay. Interestingly, it also puts the index on the graph. If that's of interest to you, it's there. 
Good? All right. Saving your plots. OK, this is a bit of a pain. There are two ways to do it. I'm going to show you both. The first is, if you know the commands you need to make your plot ahead of time, do it this way. You invoke one of these commands, depending on what kind of file you want to create. I usually go straight to PDF myself. But if you have something with a lot of colors in it, you might want to do a, bit, uh, a bitmap or a PNG, possibly a TIFF, depending on what it is you're presenting. OK? Maybe even a JPEG if you're working on photos. Generally, I don't recommend JPEG. But the fMRI people are all about it because they have to be. Okay. The problem, again, with these functions is that you have to invoke them before you make your plot. You invoke them, then you make your plot, then you turn it off, dev.off, and it will create the file with the image in it. But you need to know ahead of time what you're doing. You can't turn that on after the fact, which is a bit of a drag, which is why you do it this way. You do your code, you're, you're, cut, you're developing your plot, you're working on it, you're working on it. Finally, ah, this is it. This is perfect. Dev.copy to PDF. That's what I use all the time. Dev.copy to PDF, file equals file name. Boom. Creates the file right there. One shot. And there are other options that work similarly. Okay. Questions? This is where I start pontificating. There are a lot of bad plots out there. There really, really are. Once you start reviewing papers regularly, you'll be like, what the heck is this author trying to do with this plot? So here, I get to stand up and tell you what I think a good plot looks like. OK? First, you're labeling everything. If it's on there, I want to know what it is. I don't want to have to dig through the paper or the legend, or sorry, or the caption of the figure to figure out what this thing is. You should tell me. It should be obvious. Label it. Put units on, for goodness sake. Even if it's unitless, put on units. Okay, bugs the snot out of me when there's something there without units. Okay, if you have legend or a good use for a legend, more than one thing on a plot, two or three lines on a plot, put a legend in there. Okay, so I know what it is. I don't want to have to think. I'm a reviewer. <laughs> Adjust the font size of the axes and tick labels so they can be read. You'll never believe how many plots are out there where the plot's are there and you can't read the, what the axis is. Like, what are you thinking? Just fix it. Come on. It's not hard. I'll show you how. Okay, you've got to be able to read it. Do not, a lot of people do this, put a title over your plot. You don't need to. Okay, you've got a caption in your paper or you've got a title at the top of your slide. You want people to pay attention to you, minimize your text. You don't need a, a title on top of your plot. Do not, this one bugs me too, especially in talks. Yellow, orange maybe, light green, cyan, you can't read them. Okay, you're in some huge conference hall and someone's got yellow and cyan on their plot, some line, you can't read it. Okay, don't use them. Orange, maybe if it's a dark orange. I'll show you a dark orange later. I let it slide on myself this time. Generally speaking, choose your colors carefully. Okay, dark colors that people can read. Also, it goes for, for publications, too. If you have a, an advisor, supervisor that's willing to pay for color, mine never did, but if you do, <laughs> use dark colors so they can be easily read because shiny, glossy things can get, you can lose your yellows and, and light greens, okay? Make your data fill the plot. I hate white space in plots, okay? Your, your publisher is giving you this much space. Use it all. Okay, no white space. Very efficient use of your space. Okay, what else? Set the image size and resolution of your plot to whatever the publisher wants. When you're publishing, they will tell you your plot is going to be one column wide, generally three and three eighths inches as it happens. Not all journals are like that, but they will tell you what size you should be generating your plots. Generate it that way right away. Don't generate the default size. Scale it to whatever it is. You can do that. I'll show you how. Okay, there's no need to generate some huge figure or some tiny figure. Generate the size they want so you know exactly what it's going to look like in the publication. Okay? 
I said before, okay, don't use bitmap or stroke fonts or raster fonts. Vector, true type. In case the layout artist wants to start messing with your figures, they'll scale and they won't look terrible, because otherwise they may. EPS and PDF scale well, bitmap and JPEG do not. Okay. You'll see me harp on this more, okay? You don't need white space outside the plots. R loves it. We'll fix that. This is probably one of the few things my advisor taught me was, <laughs> which is why I'm a washed up physicist. Um, <laughs> when you're writing your paper, make a script that all it does is make that figure. That's all it does. That's its job. Because six months from now, when the reviewers finally get back to you and they want you to tweak that figure, you're not going to remember how you made it. Not a chance. No way. Okay. In fact, what I highly recommend is when you write your paper, you've got your folder, it's got the manuscript, it's got the code that analyzes the data, it's got the data itself, it's got all the post-processing co processing code. Everything is in there in one folder. Zip it up, put it away, don't touch it. You can exactly reproduce your results with everything that's in there. So that three years from now, when another postdoc comes along and wants to figure out where did you come up with this, which I've tried to do, I ran into this situation, postdoc moved on, published this awesome result, can't reproduce it to save my life. He doesn't know how to reproduce it to save his life. Would have been awesome if I could reproduce that result. Okay, make a script. That's all it does makes that plot. Okay, so you, if you need to tweak it three months from now, you'll be able to. Okay, and that'll be part of your homework assignment. And don't do this. <sighs> Chart junk. Don't litter your plot with all kinds of fancy, unnecessary, distracting things. Yeah, I don't, it's from Wikipedia. It's a fantastic example, isn't it? Look at that. I can't, I have no idea what they're trying to present here. Can't read the axes. There's color that's distracting instead of helping. Blah, blah, blah. Don't do that. OK. Now I'm going to start showing you what I think a good plot looks like. And this is how you make these plots in R. There's a lot of code here for a figure. But that's why you write this once and you never touch it again. OK. This is actually, this was published in Physics of Plasmas. Okay, a Rosby instability analysis on a, an instability we were studying. The data is actually very simple. It's only five data points. You can see them up there, 01 and 02. Okay, there's nothing to it. LM is just a linear fit of my data. Okay. Here I'm specifying, when I specify PDF, because I know ahead of time the commands that are needed to create this plot, I can specify it at the beginning of my plot script what I'm trying to do. PDF, file, rosbyinstability.pdf. Three and three-eighths inches wide, two inches high. That's the size physics of plasmas wants. Not necessarily two inches high. You can make it as tall as you want, but this is the width, three and three-eighths inches, okay? Point size is six. This is going to give me the default font size for my plot. I'm going to tweak that a little bit, but it gives me a good starting point because if you don't do that at the beginning, your plot's this tall, the the font is like looks like size 20. Your font's this, or your image is this big, and the font's this big, and you can't read what you're doing. So set something low so you'll be able to see what you're doing. Then I get rid of the huge margins. I use par. This is like mar. I said M-A-R before for margin manipulation. This is another way to do it, M-A-I. I'm not sure what it stands for, margin something. I'm setting the lower left corner and the upper, uh, no, the distance between the up, lower left and upper right corners of the plot. Okay, lower left, upper right. Just tweak them until it looks right. The size of this will vary depending on how big your tick labels are and your axis labels are. So you have to manipulate these around, okay? I choose a point symbol. I like 19, it's a filled in circle. You can use whatever you want, okay? Um, I get rid of my annotation. I get rid of my axes. I'm going to do all of this by hand after the fact. That's what all that garbage on the other side is. Set my limits, x limit, y limit. And this scales the um, text a little bit, or not the text, the size of my data points. Okay, you'll see that on the next slide. 
put, plot my line, put a box around the plot, because I don't have an, uh, a box right now, because I did axis equals false, axis equals false. And then this up here, you can play with it. We're not going to go into too much detail. That's the x-axis. This is the y-axis. Here I'm putting the ticks on, no labels. Axis side 2 means the, uh, the y-axis. And then I'm going to put the label on, or sorry, not the label, the tick labels. So the numbers that go with the ticks, because I thought they were too far away from their ticks. There was too much white space there. So we first put the ticks on, then put the labels on. Line, this line variable, moves it re with respect to the ticks. So first I put the ticks on, then the line will move it back and forth. So you get just the right amount of white space in there so it looks nice. That's what this line is doing. Then I put my title on. Again, line is going to move side to side where that goes, how much white space you have. This scales the label slightly bigger. This is also important. Expression. Who uses LaTeX? This will make LaTeX symbols in your, in your plots. Expression. Omega. Okay? Makes me an omega. This square thing is actually an underscore. Okay? It'll make it omega sub 1, omega sub 2. RPM, okay? Not an SI unit, forgive me. That's the units that we used in centrifugal fluid dynamics. Then add some text, position, scale it by a factor of two, turn it off. There's not much to it, but there's a lot of code there. You'll, Okay. No white space. Okay, it's tight. That box you see there was made by LaTeX. The boundary box is actually tighter than that. You just can't see it in this plot. If you brought it up in its own viewer, you would see it's very tight. Okay, the data fill the plot. The tick labels are close to their ticks, and the label for the axes are also tight. Not too tight. Tight enough, though, that you can read it still. Okay. And again, the plot is only three inches wide, three and three eighths inches wide, two inches tall. Yes. Um, I haven't found it yet. I'm hoping there's an answer that says yes to that because you're right. It's complicated, right? It's 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 ugly. Look at that. All that, especially this garbage, right? All this white space manipulation between your labels and your axes and your tick labels, a pain in the butt. Okay. I don't like to do it, but suppose I didn't want to do it, right? Here's the example of the code when you don't do all that. It's the same thing, except I'm not manipulating my margins and I'm not messing with my labels and putting them, and it looks like that, right? This is not three inches wide. I don't know what the default size is. It's like huge, six inches or something, okay? The data sort of fills the plot, but there's a huge amount of white space, and you're paying your publisher per page, at least we did. So if you can make your data squat, so much the better, right? You're going to save yourself a few inches. Maybe it's worth it. It may not be a big deal, but if you have 20 figures in your plot, maybe it is a big deal, right? That looks a lot better than that. Your assignment, one of the parts of your assignment, which we will post this afternoon, is to plot your data, okay? Whatever it is. I don't care what it, whatever you're working on, plot it. But I want it to look like that, not like this. Left-hand side, not right-hand side. Professional quality plot, which means listening to me spouting off about what a good plot looks like. You can go do whatever you want when you want to publish. But for the homework, you have to listen to me, which means I want a plot that looks like that. Okay, It doesn't have to be 3 and 3 eighths inches wide. If your publisher uses a different width, I don't care. This will be spelled out in the assignment, but I'm telling you now. This is what we want, okay? Not the right-hand side. Don't just throw your data on a plot and use the default everything. 
We're going to do one more example. I do this mostly to record the results than anything else. If you use contour plots, this will help you. If you don't, just relax and try to enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I'm using the fields library here. The reason is because we want to plot a color bar. Now, the filled contour, you'll recall from the contoured example we did earlier, generated a color bar, but you can't move it around. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to open a file, and I'm going to manipulate my margins, and then I'm going to use color ramp palette. This function I want you to remember. If you use colors or contours of any kind, color ramp palette allows you to customize your colors. In this case, I want to ramp between orange and blue with that many levels. And it's cool. It'll generate a ramp for you in any combination of colors. You can put more than two colors here. You can put three or four colors in there, and it'll ramp from one to the next to the next to the next. Cool. Plot.new will launch a new window, an empty window, and dot filled contour will do a bare bones representation without a color bar on top of it. I grab some stuff. I write a function to manipulate my axes. That's how bad it's gotten, right? I have to write a freaking function to write a plot, make a plot. Manipulate, 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 put my color plot on. Horizontal is false. Here's the width. Here's the length. And they're positioning stuff in there. And then I use mText. Normally, one would use text to put text on their plot. But if you want to put the text in the margins, you have to use mText, margin text. Otherwise, it'll as you run your text off your plot, it'll just disappear. <laughs> it doesn't want to do it. So you have to use mText. So here I'm labeling my color bar. Everything's labeled, right? Height, meters, and then some stuff that scales it and puts, puts it in the right spot for me. OK, it looks like this. Okay, this is data from uh, the volcano that sits outside Auckland in New Zealand. This is a topographical map. Okay, so I've got meters here from 95 to 195. Things are tight. It looks okay. There are things I would improve, though. I didn't finish it, and the reason is because I ran out of space on the slide more than anything. Okay, the margins are tight. The color bar is not too wide, and it's not too far of the plot. I like it to be close, but not too close, not so wide that it's a waste of space. Okay. Colors are fairly easy to read, I think. It's not too bad. The color bar is labeled, magnitude, units, things to improve. You'll notice there's no black line at the top or the side. We're missing a little bit of black line right there, which is weird. I would put that in for publication. Color bar should be outlined also. I would also think about adding black lines on my contours as well, on top of the plot. Instead of just using color, putting little black lines to label my contours. Again, there is not enough room on my slide. And at this point, you see where I'm going with all this, right? We're looking for clarity. We want things to be tight. OK? Efficient use of your plots. Questions? Absolutely. ggplot2 is a, uh, a plotting package. I have no experience with it, which is why I'm not presenting it today. It's got a lot of nice features in it, as I understand, for manipulating plots. Um, you'll have to ex explore it yourself. This, I've just stuck with the default stuff that comes with R. Animations. Nothing says you're awesome like an animation in your, plot, in your, in your talk of your data. If your data moves, Put an animation in your talk. Throw an animation in your talk anyway. <laughs> uh, the animation package will make animations for you, and it's amazingly painless, much better than Python, I got to say. So there are a bunch of different options. Save GIF, save HTML, save SWF, which makes a flash file, save video, which makes MP4s. Okay. Package uses a bunch of back ends, so you have to be aware. If you try to install this, it's going to go looking for these back ends that it uses. FFmpeg, for example, PNG3SFW. These are programs that assemble 
animations. All R is doing is creating a whole bunch of images and feeding it to these things. So these things have to be installed also. However, if once you get that worked out, it's actually pretty painless. Library animation, here's an, uh, some particles. I'm adjusting the interval of my frame, my frame rate, Annie.options interval, that's my frame rate now, or the, the number of seconds between frames. And then it's just that command, save video, open bracket, col, uh, curly bracket. You'll notice this is kind of a weird syntax, open bracket, curly bracket. What's actually happening here is the entire function is an argument to save video. That's what's happening. There's the open bracket. Here's the close bracket. Here's the rest of the function. And all I'm doing here is I'm creating uh, a vector, empty vector of zeros. And then I'm just going to add a random number to an all the x positions and y positions at each time step. We're going to do 200 time steps. This is a loop here, right? And then I plot it. Here's my video. All they're doing is dancing around. There's not much to it, really, but <laughs> but it's it's that easy. It really is that easy. So this is an MP4 using the code that I just that I just gave you, right? So if your data moves in time and you're giving a talk. This is cool. It's even cooler if you can embed the video into your PDF presentation, which would work if we had Adobe Acrobat running here, but we don't. But it works in PowerPoint, as I understand, if you're a PowerPoint person. So good? Cool. Yes, is cool. Right. few notes about that and then we're gonna it looks like we're stopping early today that's good okay animation is not a standard package as I said it's going to use a bunch of back ends behind uh, the R program it's going to invoke either FFmpeg or something else to create your video so be aware of that it may take a little work to install it um, the images are all stored in memory before being fed I think they're stored in memory before they're being fed. They're not being output to disk. That much I do know. So if you get too many frames, you may start to have memory problems, especially for high resolution stuff. The dots on the screen are very low memory, right? They're just dots and it's see-through. So there's nothing to it, OK? And of course, be aware of the unusual syntax here, the open bracket, curly bracket. And that's because, again, the function, the whole thing is an argument to that other function which is different, but R is a very functional programming approach language, and so this is not totally surprising that you can do this sort of thing. Questions? Yes? I'm not sure I totally follow your question. Um, oh, bar graph, OK. Sure. Yes, I think. We'd have to, you'd have to show me exactly what you want to do, but I think so, yes. Short answer. Was there another question? Or yes, sir. Can it? Um, I think it's actually it's clear by default, and the reason I know that is because normally I would have orange as my background for that slide, the the first example, because then you can really see the the edge of the plot, right? I wanted to show the lack of white space, but it shoot, all the orange went right through it, so I know it's clear. Yeah, at least for um, from Beamer's point of view. 
Other questions? Yes. How to manipulate legends. Legends um, are a little clunky um, because you have to feed all the information going into the legend by hand. It's not like Python where you can just tell it, put this in the legend as you're plotting it, and then invoke the legend function, and everything's just there. You have to go in and put them in manually. Um, I, I don't have an example, no, but the, it seems pretty straightforward from what I've seen. Um, so you just have to do question mark legend, and it'll, it'll come up and show you how to do it. Yes, yes. Um, I can't remember which uh, um, par command it is. It may be margin, but that might be global. So you'd probably, you'll have to play around and find it. But yes, that, that's another good example is taking two subplots, especially this way, and bringing them together like that so there's no space between them. And then you have a, a common axis on the, on the base, especially for time series stuff, right? Um, yes, is the short answer. Good? All right. Let's talk about the homework briefly. So one of them is going to be your plot of your data. This will be posted this afternoon. I haven't finished posting it yet. Um, plot of your data. All we want is the data, the script, and the plot. Okay. The data I only want because I want to be able to reproduce whatever it is you give me. Okay. I'm just going to run it. See if the plots match. Make sure you're not lying to me. Um, if you just want to give me a sample of your data or something, some subset, some representative sample of your data, that's fine. I don't care. Okay. If your data is too big to send to me, show me where to find it. Okay. Give me instructions on how to grab it and do whatever it is that needs to be done. Okay. Again, I want them pro, good-looking plots, ready for publication, whatever it is. Second is you're going to make an animation. Um, I have to prepare the data still, uh, but just going to create a little animation and send me the script that makes it from, well, I'll give you the file that has the data in it. So all you have to do is grab the data, make the, make the animation. Good? Okay. Now, a couple of other things. Um, several people have expressed an interest in us putting on another intro to the Linux shell class. Is anyone interested in such a class? Show of hands, maybe? Yes? Uh, what's that? Very low level, basic, how to get around on the command line class. We already gave one in September. Several people have expressed an interest. If there's an interest, I'll put one on. Uh, in a couple of weeks, let's say November, what did we say, 4th, 14, whatever the Wednesday is, 14th. Sure, I love the 14th. Basics, okay, CD, LS, M, make directory, change directory, uh, piping, redirection, grep, um, the things that you need to know so that when you're sitting and you see that prompt, you'll know what to do. So you're not completely lost. It's meant for people that have no experience. Okay. Expressions? Uh, maybe. I don't remember off the top of my head. You can go through the slides. I'll probably reuse the previous ones. Um, okay. Well, I will post such a class on the sign out education website in the next day or two perhaps even this afternoon sign up if you're interested you're welcome to come um, be aware those of you that are interested python starts next week um, for those that are interested the class is similar to this one tuesdays and thursdays weekly homework assignments the class is more geared towards physical scientists um, so we do more linear algebra as opposed to statistics um, but on the whole it's very, um, there's a lot, there's some repeated material, um, not a lot, but some, so you'll be familiar with it, but it's all in Python instead of R. So if you want to learn some Python, I recommend the class. It's not hard, um, but it's good, good again to get your feet wet in another language if you're interested in learning Python. Integration, ordinary differential equations, linear algebra, um, 
No, it's a tiny, tiny little bit of statistics, but nothing compared to this class. Um, and if you're not interested in those classes, feel free to take any of our other classes. They're all free, and everyone's welcome. And uh, if there's something you want a class in, let us know, and we'll think about it. But don't ask for Perl like someone asked. Uh, <laughs> feedback, yes, we need feedback. We'll be sending out a, some sort of anonymous survey, something, something. So please fill it out. Let us know how we did, what sucked, what worked, what you would have liked to have seen. Sure. See covered. Anyway, good. Always willing to help. Just email us. Let us know. That's what we do. We're helpers. <laughs> Good? All right, dismissed. Yes, sir. So I was talking about the course supervisor. She was saying um, it's actually a demand for our courses, basic our courses, and it's not assigned for credit. So I was wondering, should I talk to someone in my department about seeing if this could be offered for credit, or should I? Yes, yes. So Helen, so Marcelo was talking to Helen Tuesday after his wife's defense. Where's Marcelo? So what's the deal with trying to get credit for stuff like this? Helen's going to work on it or Helen doesn't know what to do? Yeah, yeah, Your EEB? Yeah, sorry, I was, I was talking with Helen on Tuesday and she mentioned that several students approached her and she said that she's going to think about it. <laughs> but my suggestion is if you, if you are an EB and you are interested in that, getting credit for one Okay. And mention her, I'll send you the link. Mention her that physics actually has a goal. I actually can't get the credit. So it's not that we are making this out of it. It's, uh, it's there is a precedent, it's just that it's not yet. There, there, so the possible. The possible path that might work, the way it works in physics is they slice up the semester into three, four-week chunks. Take care. And so they take four weeks of this, four weeks of that, not necessarily all in the same semester, mind you. They might take four weeks later on, and then they bundle up all those four weeks into a class, call it a class. So if you can get her to let you take the physics class, you'd have... Why? <laughs> I'm still online. Yeah, I know. If you can let her, if you convince her to let you take the physics class, for credit, then you but you'd have to take four more, uh, eight more weeks of classes of well, something. Doing one, you're doing so Python, so you're mostly done, yeah. and then you can take part of the HPC class if you want, because we. So that right now.